Football truly is the global game. With millions discussing its every facet in pubs, cafes and now online forums worldwide, there is so much more happening than just the 90 minutes. This series will look at the individuals who have played a key role in the development of the game we know and love. From Arrigo Saki to Pep Guardiola, these are the men who have influenced today's game beyond all others. This is The Men Who Made The Game. Anybody knowledgeable of the history of European football will have heard of the Austrian wonder team of the 1930s and the Hungarian golden team of the 1940s and 50s. Both teams which came to represent the forefront of footballing innovation with dazzling displays of their abilities. Both teams which defined their eras with stars such as Matthias Sindelar and Ferenc Puskas. And both teams with one commonality. On both sides, despite the two decades which separated their rise, are the fingerprints of one man, Jimmy Hogan. Without Jimmy Hogan, neither of these teams would have come close to achieving what they did. Without Jimmy Hogan, we may never have heard of some of football's greats like Sindelar, Puskas and Coxius. And these weren't the only sides which Hogan had a hand in creating. Throughout his long managerial career, Hogan's influence across Europe saw him play a major role in the continent's ascension to footballing dominance. This is Jimmy Hogan's story, truly the father of European football, a man whose influence very few can match. Jimmy Hogan was born in 1882 in Burnley to a Catholic Irish family. In his early life, his father wanted Hogan to seek a career in accountancy, but Hogan chose instead to pursue a career in football. His life as a footballer began at 16 with the local Lancashire side Nelson, and he made his name playing as an inside right. His proficiency in this position earned him a transfer to Rochdale, and later on a move to Burnley, where his impressive performances would continue. As a footballer, he was often seen as a difficult character, known to haggle for better wages and also showed a desire for self-improvement that was unseen in the majority of footballers at the time. As an example of this, it was around this time that Hogan and his father constructed a form of early exercise bike, on which Hogan would cycle for 30 miles a day until he realised that instead of increasing his speed, he was actually tightening his calf muscles. He was also known to seek advice from his managers as to how he could improve on the ball, at a time when most footballing teams didn't even train with the ball. In fact, training with the ball was frowned upon. Players would of course do sprinting practice and keep their fitness levels up, but as the saying went at the time, give a player the ball during the week and he would not be so hungry for it on a Saturday. According to Hogan himself, it was this constant seeking of improvement in every facet of the game that would later lead to his career as a coach. In 1905, Hogan would leave Burnley following a wage dispute, although by all accounts he was happy to get away from the primitive football which the side was playing at the time. He joined Fulham, a team which avoided the kick and run tactics which were employed by the vast majority of English sides, and instead opted for the Scottish passing game. Here, Hogan helped them to the Southern League Championship in 1906 and 1907, while also making the semi-final of the FA Cup. This semi-final would be his final appearance for Fulham as injuries began to catch up with them. Following his time at Fulham, he enjoyed spells at Swindon Town and then a brief period with Bolton Wanderers. His Bolton career would ultimately end in relegation, but it was with Bolton that Hogan got a taste for football on the continent. A pre-season tour in the Netherlands saw Bolton run out 10-0 winners against Dordrecht, and following the match, Hogan promised himself that he would return one day and teach those fellows how to play properly. Hogan didn't have long to wait. A year later, the position of coach was open, and Hogan applied. At the age of 28, he left England for Dordrecht, and took over the mostly amateur squad. In the Netherlands, his players were mostly students, and as a result were open to and keen to learn new ideas. He trained his amateur players the way he felt British professionals should have been training, not only improving their fitness, but also creating a focus on using the ball. He wanted his team to play in an intelligent, constructive and progressive, on-the-carpet manner. He began to teach the players about tactics and positional ideas using blackboards and classrooms, a familiar setting for his student players. Hogan's work with Dordrecht was successful, and his popularity led to him taking control of the Dutch national team for a game against Germany which they won 2-1. However, upon completing his contract with Dordrecht, Hogan felt that his body had more to give. Aged only 30, he returned to Bolton for a single season and held on to promotion before putting his playing career firmly behind him. In the summer of 1912, Hogan began looking for managerial work again and quickly managed to get in touch with the pioneer of Austrian football, Hugo Meisel. Meisel gave Hogan a six-week contract to work with the top Austrian clubs and prepare the national team ahead of the 1912 Olympic Games in Stockholm. Initially, the Austrian players were not impressed with Hogan. They found the Burnley man difficult to understand and felt that he focused too much on the basics. But nevertheless, Meisel was impressed with the progress he was making and found that the two men had a common feeling as to how the game should be played. Both agreed that the 2-3-5 formation, at this stage having been the main formation for the previous three decades, was perfectly suited to the team, but the style the team played in must change. 
Hogan insisted on the necessity of movement within the formation, rather than the rigid and predictable styles which the majority of teams implemented. He highlighted the importance of swift passing instead of the complex dribbling moves which plagued early football. He also understood the effectiveness of the long pass, but it had to be well aimed and not simply a hopeful punt upfield. It didn't take long for Hogan to begin making an impact, but with just six weeks to prepare, the 1912 Olympics were a tournament too soon for the Englishman. The Austrians dismantled Germany 5-1 in Stockholm, but ultimately exited the tournament at the hands of the Dutch in the semi-finals. Meissel remained impressed with Hogan and gave him the full-time job, putting him in charge of the preparations for the 1916 Olympics. His duty saw him work with the Olympic side twice a week, and the rest of his time was spent training Vienna's top sides. His services were in such demand that his sessions with Wiener FC had to begin at 5.30 in the morning in order to get to every team. Hogan and Meissel were building a serious footballing side, and were soon confidently dreaming of securing the gold at the 1916 Olympics, a dream which would be shattered by the outbreak of war. With the onset of war feeling unavoidable, Hogan approached the British consul and asked should he and his family return to England. In response to this question, he was told that there was no imminent danger. 48 hours later, war was declared and Hogan was immediately arrested as a foreign national, while his family managed to return to England with the help of the American consul. Hogan himself was released the day before he was due to be sent to a German internment camp when the Blythe brothers, who owned a department store in Vienna, agreed to act as his guarantors. For 18 months, he worked for the Blythe brothers, teaching their children how to play tennis. While he was working, moves were being made behind the scenes to bring him back to football. In Hungary, Baron Derste, vice president of Budapest club MTK, had heard about Hogan's plight and pulled some strings to bring him to Hungary as a coach as long as he checked in with the local police station once a week. Eager to return to football, Hogan readily accepted the offer. With the majority of the first team away at war, his main task was to construct a side, and for this he turned to the youth. With these young players, he began implementing his ideas and his methods brought immediate success. MTK won the title in the 1916-1917 season, and his methods were the foundation of MTK's run of nine straight title victories. Hogan himself would only preside over the squad for the first two of these titles, for as soon as the war was over he returned to England to be with his family, but his impact on Hungarian football had been felt. Back in England, Hogan found a job as a dispatch in Liverpool. Struggling for money, he was told that the relief fund which had been established by the Football Association to support footballers who had lost income due to the war. The FA Secretary, Frederick Wall, refused Hogan, informing him that the fund was for those who had fought. Hogan informed the Secretary that he'd been interned for the duration of the war and therefore had no opportunity to sign up. Wall responded by providing him with three pairs of khaki socks with the comment, The boys at the front were very glad of those. Hogan was furious and never forgave the FA. It was an interaction which would deny a conservative England the progressive footballing ideas which would likely have prevented them from falling behind the rapidly improving Europeans. Hogan's disenchantment with the FA saw him move to Switzerland and coach young boys of Bern for three years and take the Swiss side to the 1924 Olympic final before returning to MTK in their newest guise of FC Hungaria. He followed his second stint in Hungary would have moved to Germany as advisor to the German Football Federation and coach of SC Dresden. In Germany, Hogan went on a tour of the country, lecturing the attendees about the footballing style which he was implementing. With political tensions in Germany rising, Hogan's uneasiness led to a brief spell in Paris before becoming tired of struggling to maintain discipline in a team of stars and dealing with an erratic chairman. Following this, he returned to the Austrian national setup, assisting Meisel with the Wonder Team, and in 1934 he took his first managerial job in England with Fulham, lasting only a single season, before returning to Austria and taking them to the 1936 Olympic final where he fell to the rapidly rising Italians under Vittorio Pozzo. Following this defeat, Hogan tried his hand once more in England, taking the reins at Aston Villa this time. Under Hogan, Villa won the second division title and made the FA Cup semi-final, and their fortunes continued to improve, finishing 12th in their first season in the top division. But for the second time in his career, the progress which Hogan had made was being quickly brought to an end by the outbreak of war, concluding his career with Villa before he returned in 1953 to run the youth team. Hogan retired in 1959 at the age of 77, and following his retirement he settled in Burnley before his death in 1974 at the age of 91. Hogan's influence on European football is matched by very few, if any, others. Alongside Hugo Meisel, he played a key role in the creation of Europe's first truly great international footballing side, with the Austrian Wonder Team, seen by some as the first team to play in the total football style. Hogan was instrumental in the rise of Hungary as a footballing power in the mid-20th century, the groundwork he laid in his years at MTK resulted in a side which would come so close to raising the World Cup, and would deal England with their first defeat to foreign opposition on home soil. Following their famous 6-3 win over England, a match Hogan viewed as a keen spectator with his Aston Villa youth team, 
President of the Hungarian Football Association, Sandor Bars, said to the press, Jimmy Hogan taught us everything we know about football. Gustav Sebes, the coach of that Hungarian team, exclaimed, We played football as Jimmy Hogan taught us. When our football history is told, his name should be written in gold letters. When Hogan died in 1974, the then secretary of the German Football Federation proclaimed Hogan as the founder of modern football in Germany. Indeed, Helmut Schoen, assistant manager for West Germany's 1954 World Cup win and manager for their 1974 World Cup win, was one of Hogan's pupils during his time at SC Dresden. From these statements alone, it is clear the impact which Hogan had on European football. From Hogan's school of football comes the names Matthias Sindelar, Ferenc Puskas, Sandor Kokshis, and Bella Gutmann, to name a few. While he remains underappreciated in his home nation of England, his European exploits have ensured that his place in the pantheon of football's greatest remains undebatable. Jimmy Hogan was truly one of the men who made the game.